Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Keegan Street. I'm a front end developer with Deloitte Digital. And today I'm here to talk about creating a reusable Webpack config. Um, so before I get started, I just want to um, find out a little bit about what the different experience levels are like with Webpack in the room so I can um, target the uh, talk a little bit towards that. Um, so can you put your hands up if you're using Webpack on your projects? Cool. And um, can you keep your hand up if you're um, comfortable to go in there and configure Webpack and make it work for your requirements? Great. And keep your hand up now if you're um, creating one reusable base Webpack config and using it across more than one project. Great. OK, so there's a, a good mix. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that not too many people had their hand up for the last one, because um, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, but I'll also be talking about, um, I'll also be explaining some of the concepts of Webpack. So even if you're not using it much before, um, you'll still be able to get something out of this talk. Um, so I want to talk about what I think is an industry-wide shift that's been happening in front-end dev. Um, with, there's been a shift in build tooling, away from build tools being configured in each project towards build tools being configured or abstracted out um, into separate reusable um, packages and used across multiple projects. My talk today has three parts. Uh, in the first 10 minutes, I'll look at why this shift is occurring and how we made it work for us. Then I'll spend 20 minutes in a demonstration of writing Webpack config files in a reusable way. Um, and in the final 10 minutes, I'll look at the complexities that arise when you're managing multiple interrelated packages. First, I want to provide an example of what I mean by uh, build tooling being configured per project. Um, Drupal Core provides an example of build scripts being configured in the project. Um, the code repo has a folder of scripts that are used for doing things like watching the JavaScript source code for changes, and then when it changes, running it through Babel to transpile from ES6 to ES5, uh, linting it with ESLint, etc. Uh, this works for the JavaScript in core, but if you're working on a custom or contrib Drupal module and, and you want to reuse these build scripts, well, there's not much you can do short of copy-paste because they're embedded into this code repo. We can see the shift towards abstracted, shared, reusable build tooling by looking to the major front-end frameworks. Vue, React and Angular all come with their own um, build tooling packages. If you're starting a project today on one of these frameworks, you don't have to configure any build tools if you don't want to. You can use Vue CLI, Angular CLI, and create React app. So why is this shift occurring? Well, I think there's a number of benefits to using an external build tool instead of managing the build scripts in your project. Build tooling is constantly evolving and improving, and these packages are upgradable. So you can start a project today on the current version of Create React App, and then if a new version comes out in a couple of months, you can upgrade to that version. They're maintained by communities, so you benefit from economies of scale, and you're writing things once and using them many times. And they're extensible, so you don't have to do it the way it comes out of the box. You can change things around. And it's easier. Um, plenty of great front-end developers um, don't want to be configuring the build tools, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, they can focus on uh, building the interface. So Vue CLI, Create React App, and Angular CLI, these are perfectly fine if we're building with these frameworks. But how do we take advantage of this shift if we're not using a framework? As a consultancy, Deloitte Digital works across a range of frameworks, or we go framework-less for a traditional site rendered by the CMS for example, with Twig templates. We wanted to enjoy those benefits that come with separating the build tools from the project, but without being tied to a specific framework. And we wanted to have consistency in our build tooling across projects. So before I look at the approach that we've taken at Deloitte, let's look at what Create React App, Vue CLI, and Angular CLI have in common and see what we can learn from them. So here's a list of some of the main dependencies in these packages. They all use Webpack. 
Uh, we've seen a couple of great talks here at this conference about Gatsby and Nuxt, and they're doing something a little bit different, but they're using Webpack as well. It's right across the board. Uh, they all use post CSS with Auto Prefixer to add the prefixes to make your CSS work across all browsers. Um, they optionally support CSS preprocessors. They don't force you to use a CSS preprocessor, but they do support it, with SAS being the dominant one. Um, TypeScript is provided out of the box with Vue and Angular CLIs um, and is optional in Create React App, which also supports Flow, the typing system from Facebook. Babel is used heavily in the React and Vue packages, but not at all in Angular, which has gone all in on TypeScript, and it uses the TypeScript compiler for transpiling <coughs> all the way down to ES5. React and Vue use ESLint, but not Angular, which goes for the TypeScript variant. Um, and all of the packages provide a framework for running automated tests. Um, and finally, they have a lot of Webpack loaders and plugins in common, especially those React and Vue variants. In some ways, this presentation is a sequel to the one given by my colleague, Dr. Talanka Madasinghe at Drupal South last year. Talanka's talk was about using modern JavaScript in Drupal, and as a part of that, he spoke about an earlier iteration of our reusable build scripts. That iteration was built on Gulp.js, and exposed a custom CLI, but, and it did exactly what we wanted it to do at the time, but times change. Soon after Drupal South, Webpack 4 was released, then a new major version of Vue Loader for Vue.js, and the powerful but not so configurable external build tools became difficult to adapt to different project requirements. In designing our new approach, we had a number of requirements. Uh, one, simplicity was really important. We don't want to be um, maintaining a really custom set of build tools. We want to be adding a thin layer of customization on top of what's already out there. Two, uh, reusability. We want reuse across projects that are implemented in different front end frameworks and in our case, different CMSs. Three, we need to be able to extend or customize the build tooling in projects. And four, we want to be able to make incremental improvements as we deliver projects and be able to roll out these improvements to other projects. So our approach is a base Webpack config that installs common dependencies and configures loaders and plugins in a way that makes sense for a variety of projects. It can then be extended on projects it doesn't provide a CLI on its own. It's simply a Webpack config and a template for using other tools, but that's made it much more useful. I'll just give a quick explanation of Webpack. So at its core, Webpack is a static module bundler for modern JavaScript applications. And what that means is you can write modular JavaScript so without any global variables, where each module is a self-contained file, it imports the dependencies that it, ne it needs and exports its interface. So with Webpack, you can define one or more entry point files. So that is where you want the code to start being executed. And then Webpack will build up a dependency tree for all of the dependencies under that entry point. It'll bundle that code into a separate JavaScript file for each entry, entry point uh, with common dependencies split into chunks that can be shared between those scripts. Um, out of the box, Webpack only understands JavaScript and JSON files, but you can use loaders in Webpack to consume other types of files, like TypeScript, CSS, or even images, and build these into the dependency graph. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about loaders and plugins shortly. So for the next part of the presentation, uh, I'm going to explain how we make a reusable Webpack configuration that's extensible and upgradable. And as a part of that, I'll be explaining loaders and plugins and how to configure them in an extensible way with Webpack Merge. <coughs> so hopefully this talk will be useful for you if you've never used Webpack 
or if you use it every day, but you're not reusing configuration across multiple projects. Um, and I'll explain how you can make this config reusable and upgradable through publishing it to NPM and how you can use Learner to manage different flavors or variations of your Webpack config. So it's demo time. <coughs> So one of the first things to learn about Webpack is loaders. Loaders basically take um, input, process it, and return output. For example, TS loader takes TypeScript files as input, returns JavaScript output. Babel loader takes ESNext, or the latest version of JavaScript as input, and returns ES5 output that can run on all browsers. It can add polyfills in there to support features that those browsers don't support natively. Loaders can be changed together. So for example, you might run your source code through the TypeScript loader first to tr uh, transpile from TypeScript to ESNext and then the Babel loader for ESNext down to ES5. In this example, we're going to be processing this TypeScript file up here. So this is a basic TypeScript file. Firstly, it's defining a person interface, which has two properties first name and last name, both strings. Um, then it's got a greet function that takes a person as an argument and returns a personalized message. So the first thing we're, the first loader we're going to need here is the TS loader to compile this TypeScript. So I'll open up my Webpack config <coughs> file. We define loaders in the module rules section of a Webpack config file. And the test property is the property that identifies which file or files should be transformed. Usually it's a regular expression. And the use property defines which loader or loaders should do the transforming. So in this rule here, we're running all TS and TSX files through the TS loader. So let's see that in action. I'll just run Webpack. I've got a shortcut um, set through to npm start in this project. And if I open up that dist folder, we've got a generated artifact. I'll close the webpack, I'll collapse the webpack bootstrap. And we can see our function here. The, it has been converted from TypeScript through to JavaScript. There's no more person definition there. Um, this is standard JavaScript. But we can see that this is exporting ES6 with const and let variable declarations, an arrow function and a string template literal there. So that's not going to work in older browsers. One way to fix that would be to configure the TypeScript compiler to output ES5. Um, another way is to run the script through Babel after TypeScript. And some people prefer this approach because Babel can also um, provide polyfills and it supports some proposed ES features that aren't yet standards. And I'm going to use it now because it provides a good example of how we chain loaders together. So I'll go back into my webpack config file and we'll add the Babel loader. Now a common thing that can trip people up when they're new to webpack is this order of loaders. They're executed in right to left order or down to up order. So this one is going to load, is going to run the TypeScript loader first and then the Babel loader, the opposite order to which they're defined here. Um, now we want them to be running that order because the Babel loader um, processes JavaScript, so we don't want to give it TypeScript input. So I'll run this again. And yes, I just before I jump in to show that output, just want to note, another way you can define loaders is with this exclamation mark separated syntax. Um, this is more useful when you want to attach loaders in an import. So you might be importing a script and say, before I import this script, run it through this loader. When you're working in a config file, it's better to use the array syntax. So if we have a look in that generated file now, it's actually still the same, and that's because out of the box, Babel doesn't change anything. 
we need to give Babel some configuration to tell it what transforms we actually want it to make. So in that case, rather than defining the loader just as a string, we can define it as an object with a property name of loader. And then with some options. The options that we want to pass through to Babel are presets. And we want to give it the Babel preset ENV. ENV is a preset that will look at your project's browsers list definition and configure Babel to generate code to support those browsers. So in this project, our browsers list definition is in the package JSON file. There's a property down here um, which says we want to target the last one version of browsers that are still running. Um, so if I run this again, we should now see that uh, the generated artifact is ES5. Um, so that's worked. The const and let declarations are gone. Uh, we've got a standard function expression and strings are concatenated instead of as a temp template literal. So now that we've got some loaders defined, let's pretend that this file we've been working in is our base reusable config and we want to extend it for use in a project. So I know this is a really small file, there's not a lot here that you would actually want to reuse, but in a real world scenario these files can get large. Uh, you could be defining loaders for a lot of different file types with a lot of options as well. But for example purposes we'll just use this one. And let's say this other file, webpack uh, webpack config project is our extension file that we want to um, extend the original file with. So let's add an additional loader um, that processes our TypeScript files. After they've run through the TS loader and the Babel loader, we'll run them through another loader here. So we can define our module rules with the same test regular expression as before and just add one extra item into this array. So the loader that I want to use here is a really useful one called Calse. And the options that that takes are a header with a message. Now, before I run this through Webpack, I'm just going to log out the merged config so we can see what webpack merge is doing. So I'll just run this through node to see that log. And we can see here that it is merging the rules, the loaders together. So we've got Babel loader, TS loader, and then Calse loader. Um, but as I mentioned, Webpack runs loaders in the reverse order. So this is going to run Calse loader first. It's not going to work here because Calse processes JavaScript files, not TypeScript files. So we really want TS loader to run before Calse. Fortunately, Webpack merge lets us control the insert position of loaders. So we just need to reference the name of another loader. So I can say I want Calse loader to be inserted before TS loader. And I do that just by referencing the name TS loader here. I don't need to redefine options. If they're defined in the base config, they'll flow through. Um, but by just referencing the name of the loader, if I run this again, we can see this time we're running TS loader, then Calse loader, and then Babel loader. So that's what we want. If I run this through Webpack, we can see what Calse does. look at that generated artifact. We've now got Calse has done its work there. Um, so Webpack Merge is really great at merging loaders together and even merging the options of those loaders. So I could define some base options for a loader in my reusable config. 
and then override those or add to them in my project specific config. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't provide a very good way to remove loaders. So we can manually mutate this rules array to find the loader that we don't want and take it out, but that's not a very nice experience. Um, so I recommend only adding a loader to your base config if you're confident that you'll use that across all the projects that are using this config. Um, now that I've looked at loaders, I want to have a look at plugins. So I'll just close this folder and open up the second demo folder. It's also got a webpack config file, which is the same as the earlier one. So we've still got our Babel loader and TS loader there. But we're going to add a plugin here. Um, plugins are a more complicated feature of webpack than loaders. They can access all parts of the webpack compilation lifecycle. So they can do a lot more than loaders, which are predominantly transforming source code. One example is the bundle analyzer plugin, uh, which generates an interactive report on the file size and components in your build artifact. Another is the clean plugin for emptying the build folders before building. And another is the define plugin, which can define global constants in your source code that can be configured at compile time. So often that's used to expose an environment variable to your source code if you want it to function differently on development environments versus staging or prod. So plugins can be used for a lot of different things. And they're also defined in a different way to loaders. With loaders, we saw we were just defining the regular expression and array of loaders with options. Plugins are configured by instantiating classes. So here we're creating it we're instantiating the defined plugin. Um, so I'm going to create a global constant here called conference with a string value of Drupal South. And then in our project specific config file, I'll add another constant called city with a value of Canberra. Now I'll jump back into our TypeScript file and I've just declared those constants so that TypeScript knows about them. And I've updated our greet function to include those constants in our personalized message. So if I run this through Webpack again, uh, we should see that the constants are accessible to the source code. So here's our greet function that's concatenating the strings, and it's saying, I hope you're enjoying Drupal South in Canberra. Um, but it's just important to note that if we look at the, the merged config over on the right-hand side here, that defined plugin that we used in our base config and our project-specific config has been included twice. So we're not able to merge the options that get passed into a plugin like we are with loaders. Uh, that's because they're defined as instantiated classes. Uh, this is a problem area where Webpack Merge doesn't have a very nice solution, unfortunately. And for now, I think the best approach is to only add plugins to your base config if you're confident you won't need to remove or reconfigure them in projects. And then if you really do need to, then you need to manually mutate this array and find the plugin that you want to remove. You can do that by filtering on its constructor name. Oh, now I've lost my mouse. Oh, wrong, wrong screen. There we go. Um, <coughs> sorry, just a sec. Bringing back the slides. Oh, yeah, so that was this one. Okay. So just to um, quickly recap that demo. Loaders take input, process it, return output. Loaders are defined in module rules and can be chained together. Loaders and their options can be merged really effectively with Webpack Merge. 
Plugins can access all parts of the Webpack compilation lifecycle, but they can't be effectively merged with Webpack merge because they're instantiated classes, not configuration objects. Uh, Webpack config files also define entry points, output options, and mode. I didn't cover those in this demo, in this demo because they're simpler than loaders and plugins, uh, but they work really well with Webpack merge too. At Deloitte, we're maintaining three flavors of reusable Webpack config packages. There's a base config, and that's extended by a Vue.js version and a React version. And these are in turn extended by individual project configs. These three reusable configs define loaders and plugins in a way similar to the demo I just gave. So the base config uh, defines common loaders that we use, use across all projects. And then, for example, the view config adds the view loader and view plugin. Uh, but the other advantage they provide is through their dependencies. There's a joke about NPM install downloading half the internet. You, you think you're installing one dependency, but you end up installing a thousand. Because that one package has dependencies, and those dependencies have dependencies, and so on. And sometimes this is due to the packages defining dependencies that they don't really need. But often they are legitimate dependencies. And you can use this to your advantage when you're packaging up a reusable Webpack config. If we look at the package JSON file for an app that was created using Create React App, it only has one dependency for build scripts called React Scripts. And if we look at the package JSON file for React Scripts, <laughs> it's got all the things you need to build a React app. And you're installing all of these things when you install React Scripts. So you're getting Webpack, Babel, PostCSS with auto prefix, ESLint, all those things we saw earlier in the table comparing Create React App, Vue CLI, and Angular CLI. You can use the same approach in your own custom reusable Webpack config. So when a developer installs the Deloitte Webpack config, they're installing all the dependencies that we think they'll need on a standard project. One of our requirements was for our front-end build tooling to be upgradable. If we're supporting and enhancing a project over a number of years, we don't want to be stuck with build tools from the day the project commenced. So we publish our configs to NPM. And whenever we need to release a new version, we publish that. And then, of course, projects can pull in those updates with the npm update command. And they're not just updating our Webpack config when they do that, but also all of the dependencies that come in through uh, the package JSON. So we maintain release notes of what is included in each version so project teams know what they're getting. When you're maintaining a Webpack config and dependency list that a lot of projects depend on, you don't want to be a bottleneck in preventing projects from using the latest updates or latest versions of build tools. Um, if your source code is on GitHub, that's public, or Enterprise, or Bitbucket Cloud, uh, there's a really handy tool called Renovate. And this will analyze your project's package JSON file, and then see what all your dependencies are and then it will automatically open pull requests when new versions of those dependencies get released. So it makes it really easy to, to bring in updates. We've set up automated tests to verify that our build scripts work in the way they're supposed to. So when Renovate opens an automated PR to update a dependency, if it passes those automated tests, then I'm confident to merge it in and release a new version. Um, Renovate also has alpha support for Composer. So this should be interesting to try out as well for Drupal. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't yet support Bitbucket Server, which is a self-hosted uh, Bitbucket. So we have three reusable Webpack config packages. Uh, but Webpack isn't the only tool that lets you make a reusable configuration and extend it with customizations. We're doing a similar thing with ESLint, StyleLint, and Babel. And each of these config packages is published to NPM as well. It's helpful to split configs out into self-contained packages like this, because the project 
can then take just the parts that it wants instead of taking everything. But it does introduce a new challenge, and that is maintaining the interdependencies between these different packages. So for example, our React config down the bottom of this chart um, requires our base webpack config and our Babel preset for React, which requires our base Babel preset and our ESLint and StyleLint configs get pulled in as well. So this means if we want to make a, pub a change to our base Babel preset, we also need to publish new versions of three other packages so that the consumers of those packages get the changes to the base Babel preset. And you don't want to be doing that manually. But this is where a tool called Learner is really useful. Uh, Learner is for NPM projects. Um, and it allows you to create multiple packages in the same Git repo. So it's used by projects like React, Vue, and Babel. It can do things like keep all of the uh, project numbers of the various packages in SIG. And so if you change one and the others depend on that, they can all be published together. And it also makes it really easy to develop on these packages that are all interrelated because they can depend on changes that are in the other packages that haven't yet been published. So using Learner makes our um, the structure of our webpack config repo look a bit like this with a, a folder called packages and each of the packages lives in there. The bottom three are our webpack configs. Um, we've then got our Babel configs that I mentioned plus a few demo projects to show how these things are used and the demo projects also provide artifacts to run out uh, tests against. So Create React App, Vue CLI and Angular CLI clearly illustrate this shift towards reusable build scripts. And I think you can make this work for your company and perhaps we can make it work for the Drupal community as a whole with things like Webpack Merge, publishing common, or defining common NPM dependencies, publishing your config to NPM, and managing those multiple interrelated packages with Learner. Um, to get started, I think a good way is to go in and analyze your recent projects. If you're already using Webpack, see what um, load has worked well, what didn't work, and what do the projects have in common. Then take that common um, part that worked well and spin it out into a standalone reusable package that can power your next project. Um, feel free to have a look at what we've done on GitHub in the yeah, Deloitte Webpack config. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, happy to take questions. So, thanks. Yeah, yeah, good question. CSS is tricky in Webpack. Uh, Webpack was designed around JavaScript and CSS was support was added in. Um, and it brings it in, brings your CSS into your JavaScript first, um, but then you've got to get it back out if you want to be loading standard CSS files. We use um, mini CSS, uh, mini te text extract plugin, um, which is working quite well, yeah. Um, that's the one I think that is recommended for Webpack 4. So there was a, a different text extractor for Webpack 3. Yeah, I was um, using one and you had to use it as a loader and then also a plugin as well. Yeah. You just put out just separate files into... Yeah, we... Well. Yep, yeah, we've... Ours is like that, yeah. Loader and, and plugin. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have a rule that um, if a CSS file is defined as an entry point, or it's imported into a CSS file that is an entry point, that'll get extracted. But if the CSS is imported into a JavaScript file, it'll get left in there um, because maybe the developers intend for that to be delivered um, or packaged just in that module. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, just a quick question about the learner yeah. service tool thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you just quickly, quickly walk me through like, how that would work? Like, is that like a pull request start kind of thing, or do you do something like command line? Um, so you mean learner, right, with the multiple packages in the same yeah. repo? Yeah. yeah. Um, so you install it through NPM as a, um, as a global um, package. So it then adds a command line interface to your terminal. And you can go in there and run learner in it to start a new um, multi-package project. Um, so that'll go and create like your packages folder where you can create um, all the packages that you want. Um, it then it has another command called learner bootstrap, and this is what you do to do an npm install, but make packages available to all of your packages in an efficient way. So you might be working on three different packages in your multi-package project. And they all depend on Webpack, for example. But um, you don't want to have to install Webpack three times. Learner helps to make that more efficient and pull it up to the top level node modules folder and then put sim links into the three packages that rely on it. Um, so yeah, the short answer is Learner provides a CLI that you use to initialize a project. Yeah. Thanks. That's OK. Hey, yeah, so um, I'd love to know your thoughts around Webpack and tree shaking specifically and how you can get Webpack to produce smaller bundles when you've got um, loads of dependencies in your JavaScript files. Yep. Um, I, I'm not sure, it's like, so what, is there something specific that... Uh, yeah, I've, I'm playing around with Webpack at the moment and tree shaking. And yeah. I'm just trying to compare it to roll up in its ability to get just produce smaller kilobyte file bundles. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we've had challenges with tree shaking depending on how the dependency has been um, published. So it, it, whether it's using whether it's published as an ES module or require JS module and and then even though we might only be using a part of that package, it's putting the whole thing into the bundle. Um, so sometimes the solution can be importing from a different path from that package. It might expose um, multiple builds. And it, you, your tree shaking might perform better if you're importing an ES module build rather than um, like a common JS build. Or that, can be, that can cause problems with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's probably other other complexities that um, would be there as well. Um, but yeah, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. A load is the only thing that gets. <coughs> a load is the only thing that gets uh, merged. No, no. Oh. Um, loaded in reverse order. Um, I think so. Yeah. Thanks. So because plugins, for example, they can hook in at all different points in the life cycle. So even if one's defined first, it might be just operating right at the end of the build. And um, yeah, so the, I think the definition order doesn't matter so much there as it does with, or isn't as important there as it would be with loaders. And there's no such thing as an order with uh, the other things you mentioned, entry points? Uh, not with entry points or output or mode, no. no. That's all flat, so, yeah. It's okay. Hi, uh, I was just wondering if possibly it was covered in Renovate, um, whether you looked into uh, auditing NPM packages and dependencies, but it seems like now dependencies and packages are being exploited. I think there was an issue recently with one of the packages in the view CLI um, yeah. that was actually exploited. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts around that? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, that was an interesting case recently where I think uh, if this is a, the right example, um, there was a commonly used NPM package that 
one person was responsible for but not actively maintaining and then he had an offer from someone else to take control of that module and he was like, yeah, sure, I don't have time for this, here you go. So this other person um, went ahead and published a malicious version of that module that did something like tried to access people's uh, digital, yeah. So, um, s I mean, someone noticed that quite quickly and reported it to NPM, so they removed the malicious version. Uh, so you can't publish that version even if you try to now. Um, y yeah, I guess there are other providers out there that will um, audit your package JSON or package lock files for you to try and catch that more quickly. But whether they would have been aware of it before NPM, in that case, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it, I guess um, one important thing though is to make sure that you are using lock files so that you're not just asking for a, um, a range of versions for your um, dependencies, but you're very clear that I'm using this exact version and then that can be audited, whether it's through through NPM command line, which has an audit feature, um, or through a, yeah, an external service. Yeah. Cool. cool, thanks a lot.